a lot of attention to the coverage given the uh, national and international issues. But in a state like this one, as opposed to a more homogeneous, smaller state, when people get frustrated and angry, they focus that attention locally. And Sacramento really doesn't uh, find a way to their crosshairs. And of course, without accountability, we'll have the kind of responsiveness that we want to. So with the anvil falling, what's the solution? Or solutions? Well, I think the biggest problem, we haven't touched on this yet, before I come to the solution, because of course the solution is to that biggest problem. I think the biggest problem state government faces, and it's reflective of the body politic nationally as well, but on a more intense and extreme level here in California, is not just the partisanship and the polarization, but what I, what I would call the hyper-polarization, not of the electorate, but of our, uh, but within the ranks of our elected officials. California voters, if you were to spread them out ideologically along the length of the football field, from one end zone to the other, would be distributed fairly evenly. You'd probably have a slightly larger cluster, somewhat close to the center, but from the far left one end zone to the far right of the other, you'd see a pretty even distribution. Might have been slightly leftward, but only slightly. And again, you would see a cluster toward the center, but it's a pretty diverse electorate ideologically. You take the 38 million people of California off that football field, and you put the 120 members of the California State Legislature on it, and what you have out of the 120 members is 116 of them residing in their ideological end zones. Governor Schwarzenegger, like Governor Davis before him, and like Governor Wilson before him, occupied, occupies a philosophical and ideological place, if not on the 50-yard line, pretty close to it. And so, but when Arnold Schwarzenegger proclaims, as he did himself, to be a post-partisan a few years ago after he was re-elected, I would suggest to you that he may be but he is the loneliest postpartisan in Sacramento because he stands on that 50-yard line all by himself while the two legislative caucuses occupy their respective end zones. And for any of you who've ever tried to carry on a considered nuanced conversation with somebody standing 100 yards away, it's not easy. And that kind of conversation, that kind of crosstalk, that kind of potential for compromise simply doesn't exist when people can't talk to each other in a reasonable way. Um, one way, so, uh, and the reason for this uh, type of polarization, uh, some of it is just self-selection. People tend to live in a more mobile society like we have today, in communities with like-minded people. Liberals tend to cluster with liberals in some places, conservatives tend to cluster with conservatives in, in others. But uh, the way our district lines are drawn, the way our state's assembly and state senate districts are drawn exacerbates the problem. And by creating safe seats for members of one party or the other, not only have we created an ideologically rigid legislature, but even if you have this a role, an occasional rogue assembly member or state senator who actually wants to compromise, who wants to reach across party lines to solve a problem, there's a tremendous political disincentive to do so. Because if I'm elected to the state legislature in either a safe Democratic or a safe Republican district, I know because it's a safe district, there's no way I'll ever lose a re-election campaign until term limits moves me out. What's the one thing that could cost them? Well, I'll never lose a re-election campaign to a member of the other party, because the other party doesn't have enough members. The only way I'll ever lose a re-election campaign is to a more ideologically extreme member of my own party. The only way a Democratic legislator will ever lose a re-election campaign is to a more liberal Democrat. The only way a Republican legislator will ever lose a re-election campaign is to a more conservative Republican. So they have an active disincentive to compromise. So there's several steps that can be taken in order to achieve this compromise. But I think the first and most important one <coughs> has actually been taken, uh, the passage of Proposition 11 last year, to take the redistricting away from the state legislatures and give it to a, an independent commission. Um, a redistricting process is never going to be completely fair. And it's never going to be completely without favor for some interest or other. But what this initiative did is it eliminated the conflict of interest in which legislators of both parties literally, as all of you know, drew their own districts. And I used to say um, that a legislator drawing his own district is like a teenager setting his own curfew. That even if you start with the best of intentions, ultimately the needs of that individual, <coughs> the preferences of the individual, and the preferences of the best needs of the community. Um, 
We're not going to create 120 competitive legislative districts in California. You cannot create a competitive legislative district in Berkeley County. You cannot create a competitive legislative district in Southern Orange County. But I think if you do have 15 or 20 legislators, a dozen, two dozen at most, but a relatively small number, elected in competitive races, it occupies the ideological space between the 45 yard lines in such a way that a centrist governor of either party has at least a core of cooperative legislators with whom to work and try to work through some of our more difficult policy challenges. Lots of other things that can be done, but again, I think the first and most important step is eliminating this conflict of interest so we do see uh, a more centrist presence in the, in the legislature. And finally, I promise the next minister will be doing um, and I say this not because I believe that moderates of either party are inherently superior or inferior to committed liberals or conservatives, but in order to have an, a legislature that reflects the ideological diversity of California, you do need to see the center represented just like you need to see the committed left and committed right. And if you do want to see people work together across party lines, even if some people occupy their respective end zones or 10 or 20 yard lines, having that core in the middle, they're not better than the people who are the committed basis of their respective parties. But they do create a basis on the conversation and potential for compromise can take place. So that's one solution to that to love enough. <laughs> Are there questions out here from anybody? On... Yes. Let's talk about the two thirds vote. If Congress had a two thirds vote, would Congress get anything done? If the public had to vote on these things, would the public vote on two thirds vote? Is the, does the legislature take accurately reflect the public? And by a two thirds vote, does it make it much more difficult for the legislature to stay <coughs> uh, First of all, for those of you who couldn't hear Bob's question, um, he began by congratulating me for the brilliance. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Actually, and Bob, <laughs> and Bob, um, it's very flattering, but really unnecessary. In fact, you embarrassed me a little bit. I really, really wish you hadn't done that. Um, and you're right, it was a bit long-winded, but I'll, I, I'm working on that. Um, the question was about the two-thirds vote. And he began the question by a, a, a series of questions on the uh, efficacy of the two-third vote by saying, if Congress had a two-thirds vote, would they get anything done? And I. Yes, before I answer the broader question, Bob, I'd suggest that the lightning speed which Congress is addressing health care and cap and trade <laughs> legislation suggests that there are a lot of obstacles Stimulus in addition to two thirds. Well, it's still not well, it's still not exactly you know flying out the door. But to say, it, the, it but depends the on what question, he said. Part of part of the problem with health care is they can't get sixty votes, <coughs> much less sixty six and a half, right? Whatever. Um, I, I, would, I would say this about the two thirds vote. Uh, in the 1990s, when Republicans controlled the United States Senate and were extremely frustrated by Democratic senators' unwillingness to confirm the most conservative of then President Bush's judicial selections, then Senate Majority Leader Lott proposed what he called, not so wisely, a nuclear option. <laughs> Memo to aspiring politicians in the room, if you want to implement reform of any kind, calling it the nuclear option is a good way of scaring people away from the reform. <laughs> 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 But um, what Senator Lott was doing is very similar to the types of that, uh, uh, advocacy we're seeing among the majority party in California. Just if you are the majority party, Democrat or Republican, Sacramento or Washington, a two-thirds vote is very frustrating, whether it's for judges or for budgets or anything else. Because if you're in the majority, you want to get things done. So I, I would.